Good to see you guys this morning. I, uh, man, I feel, I feel good. I've been saying I've been living the dream, but I do. I feel like as a church, we're living the dream. God's hand is on us. Great stuff is happening. What a great week last week. I don't know if you guys were, uh, were here. We're in the middle of this series called Game On, In It to Win It. And, uh, you know, we've been praying uh, a lot about this series and just kind of talking about who we are as a church. And uh, the first week we talked about what winning looks like as a church. We said winning is generation after generation becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, week two we talked about the training table for an athlete, what it takes, the, the diet that we can eat as athletes spiritually um, to be at our very best on the field. And then last week we talked about what it meant to be on the team as a player. You know, what it means to actually be a Jesus follower. And I thought that was really cool because... We saw, as far as best as I can tell, we saw maybe 30 people in this church give their lives to Jesus as their leader and forgiver. Can we just take a moment to thank God for that? That's something I like to celebrate. And uh, last week, I just, I enjoyed it. I mean, last week, if you don't know, it was just the Heidelberg Catechism. That's just a tradition that we have in this church. All we did was just boom, boom, boom. We went through the questions of the Heidelberg Catechism that just explains the very core of our faith that's rooted in Scripture. And that was that was fun, and I'm excited. This week, we're, um, this week, I'm excited. This week, we're talking about finding a legacy of victory. Because I think it was cool. We had a victory last week, but I don't think God just calls us to win one time. You see, I think God calls us to win again and again and again. See, I don't just want to celebrate one good day in our church. I want to celebrate victory after victory after victory. You know what I'm saying? And I want to see that again and again. And I don't just want to be like, oh, have you ever? And, and you're good, Grant. I want to go into this story. Thank you for playing. It was Grant. I love, I love the, the way that Grant leads music. I asked him to play longer, and then I was like, you know, it's, it's good. It's good. It's, I can't do it. I can't think with, with the piano. going. It's, it's such a full grand piano and so beautiful. I almost just want to listen to it. But uh, we can't have that. Um, no, we can't. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, too, I don't know if any of you guys checked it out, but um, we are putting small group and family discussion questions on our church blog. And uh, if you go to our church website, frcweb.org, you click on the top right, there's a W icon. And if you click on that, you can get small group and family discussion questions that are up there. And um, I love that we're a church that doesn't just care about reaching people, but we care about seeing people developed into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's some of the heart behind that. We want to provide small groups and families with Sunday, Monday, Tuesday discussion. Because if we hear a great message, you know, and we're like, oh my gosh, I feel like I can run through a wall, you know. And then Monday comes. The goal is to see us not just grow on Sundays, but to live out our faith on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays too. So I want to encourage you guys to take full advantage of that. And uh, the author of this week's blog, beautiful person and woman in general, she's my wife, um, so uh, you better check it out. But seriously, this week, I want to ask you guys, have you ever celebrated a victory too early? Earlier than, you, than, than, you know, before the game was over. I remember once at my last church, I celebrated a win before we had won the game. And uh, it nearly cost us the whole thing. It was, it was a big mistake. Our church had grown a lot. It was, it was kind of a crazy season for us. In the course of a year, we had moved from a little teeny tiny, very dingy, horrible movie theater into a new building. And uh, we'd grown to, from a few hundred to, to several thousand in the course of a, a year. And so it was just crazy. It was like we couldn't handle it. We didn't know what was happening. I mean, it was, we had no idea what we were doing. We were just a bunch of kids, you know, trying to do our very best at church. And, uh, I mean, it, we had, it, was, it was so crazy that we had to turn people away from our services because they were too full. You know, and that's a good problem to have. I, pray that, I believe that we're going to have that problem here, too, which is why we need to build. But... Um, as, as the church grew, we, we came upon our Easter series, and we called this Easter series Joyride, and it was about finding joy in the Lord, and it was a car theme, and we had cars on stage, and it was really fun, and we had this opening element where we were going to like blow this thing up on the stage, this element, um, and uh, the, the series would start, the, the whole, the whole exper experience is what we called it, the worship experience started with the lights going black, poof, and then uh, this voiceover came on and said, 30 seconds to race start. Your pulse is beating. Your adrenaline is pumping. You know, and it was just that 20, and it was a countdown. It was fun. And then the lights would come on, and the cars, they were Mustangs, would start up. And it was really cool. It was a really cool opening element. And then we'd just blow this thing up on stage, which was really awesome, right? 
And so we were doing 10 services that weekend, and uh, I was running the services at the time, so I'm like, all right, go for blackout. You know, okay, lights, okay, begin soundtrack. And, and, and the soundtrack begins, 30 seconds to race start. And then on the radio, I get, pastor, pastor, we forgot to rebuild the element in between the services. I was like, what? You forgot to rebuild the element in between? That's the whole point. None of this will make sense. You know, and so all of a sudden, I mean, I just get off my, uh, the, the production chair that I was on, and I'm just sprinting to the back of the room. I mean, stiff-arming old ladies, doing the Heisman on them. It was bad. You know, babies, get out the way. We got a problem here, you know. So we're backstage. This thing takes like five minutes to rebuild, but, you know, we're grabbing hammer staplers and boom, 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 putting it back together. And, like, God's hand is on us. It's incredible. And we finished this thing. And, I mean, it was just unreal, the pressure that was on us, because there's the countdown going on in the background, you know. And so we finished it, and he's like, 10 seconds to race start. And like tears of joy, like, oh my gosh, we finished it. Can you believe it? It's so great. And he goes, five seconds. And my coworker looks at me, and he's like, Pastor, we, we got to get it on the stage. We're backstage. What are we doing celebrating? We're not done yet. The race isn't over yet. You know, we got to get it on stage, and then we have to blow it up where, you know, everybody's out the way. You know, and so all of a sudden, everybody's carrying it out there. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, they get it up and they blow it up. Nobody got hurt. But it was funny because we were celebrating our victory and we had a small victory, but the race wasn't even over yet. Have you ever done that in your life? Counted your eggs before they hatched? You know, celebrated before the game was over. You see, we need to not, we need small victories on the way to the final win, and we need to celebrate those things. But here's the truth, is I believe call, God calls us to not just win once, but to experience victory after victory after victory as a church. And I wanna celebrate the little things on our way to the big thing, but man, let's keep our eye on the prize as a church. That's what we're talking about today, is how to experience a sustained victory in our lives and our marriages. And, um, you know, if you're new to us in church or, and you're just kind of kicking the tires of faith, figuring out the God thing, I would tell you, I believe that this message, even if you don't believe in the Bible, will be applicable to you because I'm going to give you seven principles that I believe will help you experience a sustained victory in your life. And I believe that they'll work for your businesses, for your marriages, for your relationship with your kids, for your schooling. I believe you'll see victory in every area if you apply these seven principles to your life. Um, and uh, as we start, I uh, would invite you guys to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 16, which is page 329 in your pew Bibles. And then also I want to invite you, don't, don't be ashamed to pull out your mobile phone, mobile device, if you guys would like to uh, check out your uh, mobile app for that. There's a great free app called YouVersion that has like a million translations of the Bible. It's free. It works really well. I like it. Um, and uh, as, as you're turning there, let me just pray. Lord, I just ask you to use this message to speak to the heart of us, Lord and to the heart of this church. I just ask that if I say anything silly, that you would erase it um, from the memories of everybody in this room. But Lord, if, if I speak your truth, I ask that you would move in our lives and in our hearts as, our, as a church. And I ask that you would use this conversation to unlock a sustained victory for us as a church that will truly transcend generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we just turned to First and Second Kings. It's a section of books in the Old Testament. Okay, and, and the Bible is split up into two main sections. We've got the Old Testament, and we've got the New Testament. Okay, and the Bible split up into those two sections. They're both collections of books. And in the Old Testament, there's these two books, First and Second Kings. They're like my favorite because they're about like kingdoms and princes and princesses and, and knights. And, and, and as a kid, you know, I'm a little nerd. Um, but I love stuff like that. I thought, I thought that was amazing. So I love these books. And, and the part I love the Bible is, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty raw. It's pretty real, you know, and, and, and first and second kings, the kingdoms, they were kind of a soap. They were Camelot for sure, you know, um, so I really enjoyed reading that in first and second kings, and the king that we're going to read about today, his name's Solomon, and uh, his background is he is, he, he will end up ruling over the nation of Israel during its greatest time ever, okay, and so he presides over the kingdom during his strongest moment, and during his reign, he actually becomes the richest man on earth, ruling over the most splendid kingdom in the world at that time. So it's kind of a big deal. He's a big king. He has a great reign. He's also known for being smart. In fact, God gave him a supernatural wisdom that happens just before this. So if you're looking to read something um, in the Bible this week, you can read 
the story of David getting his wisdom for the first part of 1 Kings chapter 3. That's fun. I'd encourage you to do that. Um, but anyway, David is, or not David, Solomon. Solomon is holding court. And uh, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but kings used to hold court. Have any of you guys ever had a court date? You know, maybe you've been in trouble with the law. You have a court date. And, and I, hey, look, I'm just being real. You know, speeding ticket, whatever. Um, but look, when you have a court date, that word, that phrase, that whole system actually draws its heritage from kings holding court. Because if you got in trouble with the law or you had an argument that you couldn't set, settle back in the day, you would go to court and you'd have a court date, but you wouldn't go see a judge. You would go to the king's court and he would preside as judge over your situation. Does that make sense? So that's what's happening right here. These two ladies have an argument that they can't sell. They're arguing with each other and you know they've got to fight. And so they decide to go to court, to the king's court, so that he can help them resolve an argument. Okay, and so here's where it picks up in 1 Kings chapter 3, starting verse 16. It says, Sometimes later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. And point number zero, it's not on your notes, notes, but point number zero that I believe is really important for an organization to move forward is you have to have a system set up to resolve conflict. You see, the first thing that these two ladies have, they have an argument, and in order for their organization to move forward, in order for this, these two friends to move forward, in order for their friendship to succeed, they need to have some sort of system of authority to appeal to. And I think a lot of times organizations, churches, get this wrong. God gives us this great chapter in Scripture, Matthew chapter 18, that tells us how to resolve arguments, you know. But a lot of times, I, I don't think churches do that. And so what happens, instead of dealing with conflict, instead of people submitting to the authority that God lays out for us, we just have an inability to resolve conflict. We get stuck in it. You know? But these two ladies get it right. They are submitting to the authority in their kingdom to resolve a conflict that they've come across. Okay? The story goes on. It says, please, my Lord, one of them began. This woman and I live in the same house. And I love the context of this. When you guys read scripture, you know, I just really encourage you to think about what it says. Because look how she's referring to her friend. She lives with this woman. They are in the same field, and yet she calls her, instead of her roommate, instead of her friend, she goes, this woman, when my wife has had a really, really bad day with my daughters, okay, our daughters, a lot of times I will come home and she'll be like, you wouldn't believe what your daughter did, John. You know what I'm saying? This woman, this woman, and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were only two of us. In the house. Now, I'd encourage you guys to think about this because a lot of times the scripture lays out some contextual background stuff, and you're like, blah blah blah. Let's get to the plot, right? That's the American way. Let's just let's just skip this and skip ahead to what what matters. Let's just come on, come on, come on. Let's get it going. But this is really crucially important stuff. Okay, what do we know about these two women? They are prostitutes. Okay, they are in the sex slave trade. Not a good industry to be in, um, both then and now. We know that they have probably been traumatized on multiple different levels during their life. Furthermore, we know that they've just had two babies. They, were, they are not in a lucrative field to begin with, but we know for a fact, because they have just had two babies, that they are almost definitely out of work. And if they were living hand to mouth at one point, they are now almost certainly destitute. Furthermore, their household has two more children to take care of. Okay? So things are going well. Things are not good right now for these two ladies. And something worse, as you'll see, has just happened. It says in 1 Kings 3.19, um, but her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. It's just a huge advertisement for co-sleeping right there. No, just kidding, just kidding. But then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that he wasn't my son at all. Oh my goodness. Tragic story. And there's so many things to come. I mean, that is like a crazy segment of scripture. First off, I just think, have you ever made a mistake? It was an accident, but you had irreparably damaged your life. I just imagine that woman. Things weren't going well. And then imagine what these sons were to these ladies. These sons, they had never been treated right by men. But God had given them two boys, and, and they had probably put their hope in these sons, saying, this is my retirement. This is someone who will protect me someday and take care of me. My hope is in this child for my life. And in the middle of the night, one of these women wakes up. Not only has her son died, 
but because of a mistake she made, her son has died. I made some mistakes in my life, and I know, I know that feeling where your gut just drops, and you wish that you were dead. Oh. Now she has a choice in this moment. She has a choice in this moment. She can choose to face the problem that has happened in her life. It would be difficult, immeasurably difficult, but she could choose to face her problem, believe that God has a future for her, and walk into it, trusting that God's hand is on her life, and she could move forward. Or she could run away from her problem. And as we read in the story, what she does is she runs away. And I really believe the first way to stymie progress in our life, to stop a victory from happening in, in our life, in any area, is to run away from our problems. In our marriages, in our relationship with our kids, at our workplace, and especially as a church. If we want to sustain a victory as a church, we have to, we have to, consistently, continually, and healthily, systematically address our problems. We must address our problems. That's what healthy organizations do. That's what healthy people do. That's what healthy marriages must do. M problems happen. Believe it or not, Kristen and I have gotten in a fight before in a marriage once or twice. But praise God that we had wise people in our life who encouraged us to work through and face those difficulties, as insurmountable as they may seem, okay? So the next thing that I note in this passage is that she does something really interesting. Rather than face her problem, she runs away from it in a really unique way. You see, she looks over at somebody else, and she says, oh, she's got a baby. What if I just steal her baby? What if I just steal her life? Because I want the life that she has, and I hate the life that I have, why don't I just steal her life? Have you ever done that? Have you ever known someone who's done that, you know? Rather than living the life that, you gave, that God gave you, it's so, it's so difficult right now, you just can't face it. You think, maybe I'll just take someone else. I did that in college. Stole someone else's life. You see, my brother was a junior at Wheaton College. Um, I always say Jesus' is alma mater. Um, and uh, I went there as a freshman, and Enoch was kind of the big man on campus. My brother was the big man on campus. He had these great friends. He had a really winning intramural championship team, really good group of athletic friends. And uh, I loved the fact that they were winners, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to hang out with his friends. Rather than making my own, rather than establishing an identity of my own, I'm simply going to steal his life. I'm just going to do what he does. So I just followed my brother around. I lived his life. I didn't bother forging my own friendships, even though they already had two years deep into their friendships. Rather than, rather than making friends with people in my own class, in my own age group, rather than going through the awkwardness. I mean, I was a big deal in high school. Nobody here knows that. You know, I don't want to deal with building a reputation. I'm just going to follow them. You know, and so I did. And I missed out on the unique identity that I could have had in school. And I just stole my brother's life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at someone's marriage? Kristen and I have a great marriage, but I promise you, if you guys try to steal the marriage that we, got, that we had instead of forging your own unique identity as a couple, you'd hate your life. You couldn't handle all the fantasy Harry Potter books and stuff that we read. You'd go crazy. You can only handle so much sci-fi in a week before you go nuts. You can't handle what we have because guess what? God made it for us, not for you. And God has blessings in your marriage. Teenagers in school, don't try to live someone else's life. God has a unique and special heritage and destiny for you. And you might find it difficult right now to face your life. But face your problems and walk towards the victory that God has for you rather than stealing someone else's. And guess what, First Church? God has a unique identity for us as a church. And we could look at Faith Church and Dyer and be like, look at Faith Church and Dyer. Look what they're doing. Let's just do everything that we're doing. We, they're doing. We don't even need to think independently. We can just do what Faith Church does and that First Church will be Faith Church. But guess what? We're not Faith Church. We're First Church in DeMott. And God has a unique identity, destiny, heritage, purpose, and plan for us in this community. And we will never be Faith Church and Dyer because God has something even better for us. And I want to boldly walk into that. Now, I'm not saying you can't learn from other people, but eat the fish and spit out the bones, right? 
Golly, people, it's not that hard. We don't have to take it all in one mouthful. We'll be like, oh, I'm crunchy, but it's fine. It doesn't really fit us. I'm dying. Right? Face our problem. Walk into the identity that God has given us. Live our own lives. Now, here's the deal. The argument goes on in verse 22, okay? She just got done explaining the situation. She goes, and in the morning when I tried to wake up and nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted. It certainly was your son, and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said. The living child is mine, and the dead one's yours. And so they argued back and forth before the king. I just, I really want you guys to put yourself in this circus of a scene, okay? We know from later context that, one, there's a newborn baby. Two, they have brought the baby that has died to the scene as well. And three, there are two women arguing over a newborn. This is Jerry Springer. This is Jerry Springer 4,000 years ago. We should sue him for copyright infringement. He stole God's idea. This is, you can't even make this up. This is too real for reality TV. This is happening right now in his court. And think about it. People are like whispering like, what's happening? Oh my gosh. And it's a rumble and everybody's like, oh, you know, they're insulting each other. This woman, oh, you know. It's going on in there. And this is the part that blows my mind is they're arguing back and forth. One baby has already died this morning. And here they are, instead of caring for a three-day-old baby, they're arguing and arguing while this baby languishes, starves. God has a plan and a purpose. This baby needs to be nourished, and they get caught up in arguing over the baby. This is ridiculous. God didn't call us to argue over babies. He called us to raise them, right? Come on, ladies. People in the court are horrified at the treatment that this baby is getting. And here's what I want you to know. Unresolved conflict kills progress and lets spiritual newborns die. I've seen the craziest things happen. I knew these two guys that own this giant medical corporation. Tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in this corporation. Two partners, worked together for a long time, got in an argument over a zero-turn Husqvarna riding lawnmower just a few years ago. Okay, this lawnmower at most is 5,000 bucks. Teeny tiny fraction of the whole worth of their company. They get in this blowout argument. Been partners for 20 years. Partnership dissolves. Business cannot operate without these two people working together. Business dissolves. Both people lose their business and their fortunes over a Husqvarna riding lawnmower. When they were worth millions. Are you kidding me? Guys, God has given us something worth so much more, so much more, so much more than that business. And the eternal souls that he gave us, even last week. And when we get caught up, when we get caught up in these silly little arguments, can you hear it? Eh, eh. There are babies that need to be fed. There is a kingdom that God's calling us to build. And we have a plan and a purpose that is so much bigger than a petty little argument. Than about which side of the toast to butter. I mean, come on, guys. Come on. Seriously. God has something for us that's so much bigger than this. And I've watched it happen. You wouldn't believe the stuff that I've seen. This is the heritage of churches around the country. And it breaks my heart. Because people in that court that day. It was a circus. It was a spectacle. But I guarantee you that most of the people who were outside of that argument that was going on simply felt bad for that baby. It's a responsibility. A story goes on, and this is, this is where it really starts to get interesting, okay? It says, then the king said, let's get this back straight. Both of you claim that the living child is yours. Each says that the dead one belongs to the other. And I think this is so important. I think this is so important because what is Solomon doing right there? He, as a leader, is understanding the intimate details of a situation on the ground. He is the ruler of the most splendid kingdom on the face of the earth. And it is very important. I, as a leader, think it's really important that we fly at 30,000 30, feet sometimes. We need to be able to look down on where we're going. We need to be able to see the horizon and lead people to that place. But it is also important that leaders of businesses, leaders of marriages, leaders of families develop a way to understand intimately what is happening on the ground, too. Leaders have got to get the facts straight. 
I love that Solomon does that. And I want you to know, First Church, this is so crucial for us on every level. If you lead a ministry within the context of this church, we need to understand. You need to understand the details, the struggles that people have within that ministry. You know, I love that we have a consistory. One of the things that attracted me to this church is that we have an administrative consistory that at least, as far as I have seen, does an amazing job through Let's Talk Live, communication, of understanding the needs and movements within this church. That is special and unique in churches. And I love that. I love that we're doing that. But anyway, the story goes on. This is kind of weird. He goes, let's get the facts straight. Here's about, and then in verse 24, he says, all right, okay, bring me a sword. So they brought the king a sword. And I just think it's a little funny that there, there are these people arguing in the room, and the king says, all right, bring me a sword. It's like, well, that was kind of mis, mis I, I didn't expect that. You know, you see the circus going on, and it just, it wasn't, it was kind of a non sequitur. What's the point with the sword? And the room is kind of talking. There's a baby crying. Two ladies arguing. No, it's my baby. It's my baby. You know, and uh, the king just starts looking at the sword. I just imagine Solomon just kind of looking at it. Oh, yeah, that is sharp. And all of a sudden, a hush falls over the room. The room starts to get quieter because these, these ladies didn't even hear what was happening. The king got the facts straight. Nobody was listening. Nobody cares. All of a sudden, the king's holding a sword, and for a split second, those two mamas look up, and they recognize that just for a moment, not only is he presiding over the situation, but he's a royal sovereign. I mean, he could kill us. This is a big deal, you know? So the king picks up the sword. He says, bring the sword. And then he says, cut the living child in two. Give half to one woman and half to the other. Then the woman who is the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh, no, my Lord. And we never actually know who was at fault here, who was telling the truth. We just know that the real woman cried out, Oh, no, my Lord. Give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, All right. He will neither be yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, Do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live. For she is the mother. Now, the Bible says, the Bible says that the real woman, the real mother got the baby. And I believe that's true, but a lot of times I just think even if she wasn't the real mother, she was the real mother. You know, what is the mark of a parent? Somebody who's able to place their child's needs ahead of their own desires and needs. It's a big deal, you know? And on the one hand, you have the one woman who says, chop that baby in half. Do it, because if I'm not happy, I don't want anyone else to be happy. And she believes this lie. There's this little lie that I think I think really proliferates our society, and it's, if I can't get my way, if I am miserable, I want to make everybody else around me miserable, because then I will be happy, right? That's the lie that we hear. I need to make everybody around me miserable, because if everybody around me is miserable, then I will somehow be happier, and this is the truth, and I really, I really want you to know that the truth is, when you make everyone around you miserable, you will not be more happy. That is the truth. You can take it to the bank. I've done this. I've done this. When I am miserable, I have worked scrupulously hard. Scrupulously? Where I had no scruples. I have worked very hard to ruin everybody's life around me. Just ask my parents. I'm a pro at this. Okay? And it did not, it does not bring joy. And you know this. Not a person in the room who really hasn't done this at some point in our lives, right? But we believe it. And she says, just chop that baby in half. Her selfishness is destroying the victory that could have been had in that situation, right? I think selfishness destroys our victories all over in our life. I've seen selfishness destroy marriages. Well, if I'm not going to be happy, if, I, if I'm not happy in my friendships, well, I'm going to work extra hard at ruining the friendships that she has. I'm going to chop those in half. I see this at work. Well, if, if I can't, get the recognition that I need for this job. I'm going to make sure that he gets no recognition either. And we're just going to chop the momentum and excitement and customer base that this company has right in half, right? And then in churches, this is my favorite. This happens in churches. This is how it works in churches. Somebody says, if I can't get my way in the church, if my ministry isn't going to happen the way I want it, if you're going to shut down what I wanted to do, well, then let's just split that church in half. Let's just cut it right down the middle, let it bleed out. Because if I can't be there and be happy, I don't want anyone else to be happy. I just want to cut that right in half, right? 
Isn't that the game that we play sometimes? We do it and we watch it bleed out. And listen, listen, I love that this is, I love that this is called First Church. It's called First Church for a reason. It was the first church in this town. I love our heritage. I love how God has moved in this church. When I drive around town, I look around, and I love to think every other church is here because of the ministry and boldness of the people who planted this church. But then again, it breaks my heart because so many of the churches in town were birthed out of somebody selfishly chopping. And I think that's a cool heritage, but can you imagine what 120 years of unity and excitement and selflessness would have brought this church? Can you imagine where we would have been? I think it would have been 20,000 people. I think Jasper County would have been a regional capital of this state. A regional center of commerce. I think God could have done great things when people in his kingdom said we want to honor God's plan and purpose for our lives together in unity, putting the other needs, the needs of others and the needs of the church ahead of our own. I think Satan just loves this too. When people play this game and they selfishly chop something in half, I think he's got first church. He's had first church mounted in his man room like we mount deer over the mantle. He's got churches all over the place. Would you believe when I got the crossing in Minnesota to get arguing over that silly little thing and people got their feelings hurt and then published a bunch of horrible blogs and, and all these people who were new to God just left the church and evaporated in a moment because of those mudslinging people? Can you believe that? I mean, he probably just laughs at it. Can you believe that I stymied that marriage? That marriage? God was going to do such great things with it and I just stymied it and he's just got that marriage mounted on the wall right there. And can you believe can you believe, you know, he's got, I believe that he's had first church on his wall, too. Now, this is what the second woman says. She says, you know what? Even though I'm going to have to watch this baby get raised by my mortal enemy, even though this woman is lying, even though I will miss out on the security and purpose that I could have accomplished by having a relationship with my son. Even though my son will never know that I'm his mother, I don't want him to get chopped in half. So just give him to that lady. That is a selfless, that is a selfless decision that she made in that moment. And because of that, no matter what, her son lived, right? And I believe that selflessness sustains our victories. Now, I'm not telling you, if you are in an abusive relationship, call the police, okay? Call the police. Put that guy in jail. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. If you're getting hit, that's that, that, don't stay in there. But listen, when you can be selfless and you can rejoice with someone else's victories and you can take joy in how God is blessing them, understanding that their blessing doesn't detract from your own, God will sustain victories in your life. I believe that that is the truth. You know? Now listen, it goes on. It says, then the king said, don't, give the chi uh, don't kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is the mother. And when all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king, for they saw the wisdom that God had given him for rendering justice. This is, this is what I love, and this is the truth. This is what I want you to understand about our God. Our God will get his glory, regardless of whether we're a part of it. But it is an adventure that we get to be a part of. It's an adventure that we get to be a part of, that we choose to be a part of, out of great joy. And you know how many times if I watch Gandalf knock on Frodo Baggins' door, or Bilbo Baggins' door, I thought, man, I want to go on that adventure. I want to walk into the heart of Mount Doom and throw the ring of power into the, into the lavas that made it to undo the ring of power. You know, maybe you guys haven't thought that. But I want to have great adventure in my life. I yearn for it. God wrote it on my heart. God wrote it on so many of our hearts. I want to go. I want to be a part of a great adventure. God has a great adventure for us and for his church. It's a great adventure. And all we have to do is say, you know what? God, I want you to use me. I want to be a part of it. I want our legacy as a church to be part of this. That's what I want to do. Listen, as we look back at the fields of harvest in our life, I know sometimes it's difficult to push off on a new adventure as the old one is wrapping up. You know, I mean, it's difficult as the combine takes in the last few rows of corn. I mean, there's so much that's happened here. 
You know, my children were raised with that tradition. I was born into that legacy and that heritage. It's difficult to walk into new adventure. It's difficult to leave old fields of harvest. But listen, when there's no more to be harvested there, we have to step in to do, into a new adventure together. You see, I believe that God has called us to season after season after season of harvest. But if we as a church want us to have a sustained victory, we have to continually be walking into new field after new field after new field. And it's hard. I get it's hard to leave an old one. But man, there's, the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Amen. And I believe it. I believe that there are many great fields for us to conquer as a church. And I understand that it's difficult to watch something or someone that you love be raised by someone else. But God hasn't called us to kill his babies. He's called us to raise them. And by God, that's what we're going to do as a church. My favorite passage of scripture, and I just want to end with this. This is what Jesus says in John 13, 34. The disciples are arguing with each other at the Last Supper about who's the greatest. Who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm the man. No, I'm the man. Sounds like an argument that I'd have with myself. But anyway, it says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, and I want you to underline this or highlight this on your mobile device or in your Bibles. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. What is the mark of a Christian? What is the mark of a Christian? How do you know someone is a disciple of Jesus Christ? If they love one another. By their love for one another. How do you tell if a church is a church that is honoring God's name? If the people in that church are loving one another and loving that community. Guys, I'm calling, this whole series, this whole series leads up to this point right now, and this is what I want to say. Come on a new adventure with us. Guys, let's cast off from the dock. Let's cast off from the shore. We had a great heritage over there. God did great things over there. It was awesome, but it's time to go on to something new, and I want to put away the sword of selfishness, and I want to pull out God's sword of truth, which is his love for one another. Our legacy, our legacy of argumentation, that's over. It's already over. When you talk with people in this town, it's done. We know it. Our new legacy, our new heritage, our new destiny is one of love for one another and one of love for this community because God's got greater things for us. And you know, 120 years are done and we can look back at what that had, but I'm more excited about the next 120 years. I'm excited about the next legacy and the next heritage. And I just believe as a church that God's gonna do great things through us and in us as we walk in love for one another. I just wanna invite you to stand as I close in prayer then we'll sing this song. Jesus, I just ask in your powerful name that you would rewrite our legacy and heritage and culture as a church. Jesus, we repent for the petty things that we've done. Lord, and I'm guilty of that too. And I just ask in your name that you would speak the promise over our lives, that you erase our past and give us a future. I ask that we would be known for our love for one another as a church. I ask that you would do greater things still. And as, as we push off from this dock together as a church, I ask that we could love each other in unity as we walk into a new destiny. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I'd invite you to sing this last cantata with us.